Yeah. So uh, I welcome you all to another session, and this session is based on what? This session is based on the discussion of the full length test on GS paper one, or which is paper two, and I will be covering those questions which are related to Indian history, art and culture, and Indian society. Okay. Very very important. All the three. Topics are extremely, extremely important. So let's begin with today's session. Okay. So, uh, so this was the very first question. Okay. This was the very first question. So this was question number one, and it was a ten marks question. That is a question which you had to answer within one hundred fifty words. So as you can see, this is the question. Okay. The government of India Act nineteen thirty five was the most comprehensive law enacted in British India. Explain. Okay, so the question basically is on Government of India Act 1935. Now see, the Britishers while they were ruling in India, they had enacted. Okay, they had enacted many laws. They had enacted many laws or acts. Out of all those laws, okay, out of all those laws, the most complete, the most complete law was the Government of India Act 1935. Okay, it is the most complete, most comprehensive law. So, in this particular question, you have to do what? You have to basically talk about the law. Uh, you know, at at at. Uh, you have to talk about this particular act at length. You need to explain the various contents of this particular act. So, let's begin. See why it is known as the most comprehensive. Why it is known as the most complete act? Because see, this act is. very very huge this act is huge it had a lot of contents it had so many contents this particular act had so many contents that the contents were divided into three broad uh, broad categories just imagine just imagine how uh, you know how heavy just imagine how detailed this law was that the content had to be divided in three broad categories now if i have to name those categories number 1 Number one, the first part of the law was related with what? The first part of the law was related with the central part. Okay, the first part of the law it is also known as All India Federation. That was the first part. What was the second part? I will tell you about what will come under All India Federation in a bit. But before letting you know that, let's talk about the second part. Now the second part dealt with what? The second part dealt with the provinces. First part was All India Federation. or you can also call it the central part the second part dealt with the provinces that is uh, you know that is that is the state level and the third part can be termed as miscellaneous things okay the third part can be termed as miscellaneous now if we talk about the all india federation okay the very first important thing which was brought in by this particular act was what this particular act introduced Okay, this particular act introduced, and most of the students who gave this examination, okay, most of the students who gave this examination, and I evaluated the, I evaluated so many papers, okay, because we had conducted a full length test, and most of you have got this right. You have mentioned that Daya Ki was introduced at the center, okay. Daya Ki was a political setup, as we all know, it was introduced at the center, but just mentioning this will not do. You also need to explain it a bit. Why? because i get it it was it is it was a 10 marks question okay no doubt about that okay you also have to keep the size in mind you also have to keep the word limit in mind all that is fine but the challenge is to write okay the challenge is to write a meaningful answer within 150 words you cannot you know you cannot just for the sake just for the sake of writing an answer within the given word limit you cannot compromise with the content your content has to make sense in the first place so uh Number one, okay. What is the first thing that will come under All India Federation? That is what. That is that Daya Ki was introduced at the center. Now, what is the meaning of this? Daya Ki was introduced at the center. It means that topics or items or let's say subjects were divided. Okay, subjects were divided into two lists. Subjects were divided into two lists: reserved and transferred. Now, reserved and transferred means what? certain subjects okay certain subjects for example defense security okay certain subjects like defense or you can also call them the most important items or subjects defense security okay defense then security then 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 then, then foreign relations all these subjects or only these subjects were reserved only these subjects were reserved for whom only these subjects were reserved 
for the Governor General Executive Council. What was the Governor General Executive Council? It was the Executive Council of the Governor General of India. So, as far as these items or these subjects are concerned, only the Governor General Executive Council could take decisions on these three things. For example, defense, IR or international relations and let's say defense, IR and all those things. Okay, they were reserved. They were reserved and let's say communications. So they were reserved for Governor General and his Executive Council. Now, let's talk about the transferred list and the transferred list included all the other subjects. All the other subjects were put in the transferred list and, and the central legislature, the central legislature, the central legislature was given the right to take decisions to make laws on those transferred lists. And what did Okay, what did or what was the central legislature all about or whom was it made up of? The central legislature had a lot of Indian representatives. Okay, the central, most of or the Indians had a majority. By this time we are talking about 1935, the Indians had attained a majority. Indians had attained a majority in the central legislature. So, the central legislature could take decisions being mentioned. The central legislature could take decisions being mentioned in the reserve list. Only three items, defense, communication, okay, defense, communication and foreign relations. Only these three items were reserved for the Governor General Executive Council. Other than that, all the other items could be decided upon by the central legislature, which had a lot of Indians or which had the most number of Indians. The Britishers were also there, but they were in minority. Now, so this was the most important part okay this was the most important part which will come under all india federation then number two now as far as central legislature okay as far as central legislature is concerned central legislature the composition of the central legislature was also radically changed the composition how many members will be there okay so the composition itself was radically changed we already know that bicameralism Bicameralism was already introduced at the center by Government of India Act 1919. Government of India Act 1919 had introduced what? Bicameralism. That is two houses at the center. Now, the composition of these two houses will be radically changed. Okay, the composition of these two houses will be radically changed and these two houses came to be known as Council of States. These two houses came to be known as Council of States and Central Legislative Assembly and Council of States was also known as what was also known as Upper House and Central Legislative Assembly came to be known as Lower House now and the composition of these two houses was also radically changed okay the composition was also changed and the most important part I'm coming to the most interesting part now see now we all know that British India okay when we say British India we uh, roughly talk about two geographical locations one was the British provinces the other was the princely states now for the first time see the government of India Act 1935 is allowing the princely states or is allowing representatives from the princely states to be a part of the central legislature okay and it clearly says it clearly says it says that who can be members of the central legislature of these two houses council of states and central legislative assembly it says that from the as far as the british provinces are concerned indian representatives will be elected okay a direct you know direct elections will be conducted and indian representatives will be elected now i mean obviously direct elections they were not they were not the kind of direct elections which we get to see today okay Today India follows what? Today India follows universal adult suffrage. Every individual above the age of 18 or 18 years of age can cast vote. It was not so. Okay, it was not so during the British rule. It was not so. Only a few individuals had the uh, had the had the had the right to cast their votes. Only a selected few individuals. Okay, but that is another thing. So uh, it said that we will conduct direct elections to elect whom to elect Indians to elect Indians from where? From the British provinces. And as far as princely states were concerned, this particular law said that we will, we will what? We will select, we will select representatives from the princely states. Okay, my dear friends, focus on the word select. There will be no elections. They will only select representatives from the princely states. So what was the real intention of the Britishers? 
the real intention and see if you focus on the word select so what could have happened the the plan was what what was the plan the plan was to let the rulers of those princely states to nominate their representatives to nominate their representatives and please remember that as far as princely states are concerned princely states from the very beginning they have always been loyal to the britishers okay princely states have always been loyal to the britishers they have the, uh, the rulers okay i'm not talking about the people living in the princely states but the rulers the rulers of the princely states have always been loyal to the britishers so the britishers now must have thought that if we can have representatives from the princely states who are being nominated by the rulers of this uh, of those princely states then once those people become a part of the central legislature they will block the progress of the rest of the indians belonging to british provinces so it was a plan big scheme it was a plan being made by the britishers to not let to not let the indians of the british provinces move ahead with their nationalistic plans i mean okay it was a well thought of strategy uh, so uh, so this was the second most important thing which will come under all india federation the third okay the third most important thing is a decision was also taken by government of india act 1935 to introduce what to introduce a federal court okay to introduce a federal court and under which under which the court was shifted from calcutta to delhi and the intention of this federal court was to solve the disputes okay to solve the disputes happening between the center and the provinces the court which eventually post india's independence came to be known as supreme court of india then number 4 okay another thing which will come under all india federation is that three list okay in order to do what in order to distribute or you can say in order to uh, you know in order to distribute the areas okay in order to distribute the subjects or you can say in order to promote some kind of federalism okay you all must be knowing the meaning of federalism it's a very very important part of indian polity now to promote some kind of federalism three list were introduced three list okay union list concurrent list and provincial list now this may sound very familiar to you guys because india still has got these three list with the only difference that today the provincial list is known as state list so as you as you may have as you may have made out till now this concept of having three list which is one of the core features of indian federalism has also been taken from government of india act 1935 okay so this was another thing which will come under all india federation now if i have to talk about one more thing which could which will come under all india federation is that you know the principle of what the the, the it also said okay this government of india act 1935 also said that in the event of a clash in the event of a clash happening between okay in the event of a clash happening or uh, in the event of a clash happening between a central law and a provincial law okay what will prevail the central law will prevail and india still follows it till today okay but it was originated it was mentioned for the first time by government of india act 1935 and the same act also gave the residuary power to the governor general of india what is the meaning of residuary power residuary power means the power the power to make a law the power to make a law on that subject which has not been mentioned in any of the three list today the residuary power okay today i'm talking about independent india as per the indian constitution the residuary powers are today reserved okay they are they are they are they are today given to the central government okay only the central government can uh, make laws on those subjects which have not been mentioned in any of the three list but at that time the residuary powers the concept of residuary powers was introduced by the government of india act 1935 now now i hope you guys are realizing the importance of government of india act 1935 then that was the all india federation now let's talk about what this act meant for the provinces okay now let's talk about what this act meant for the provinces now as far as provinces are concerned a very very important this law becomes extremely important because provincial autonomy a great degree of autonomy was introduced at the provinces a great degree of autonomy was introduced or was given at the provinces by government of india act 1935 now what was that great degree of autonomy it was mentioned by this act 
okay it was mentioned by this act and it was decided under this act that provincial legislature will have indians okay it was decided under this act that provincial legislature will have indians and okay it was decided that provincial uh, legislature will have indians and so on. now you have to understand one thing before this how was the setup like the setup was government of india act 1919 e ki korisil government of india act 1919 e diarchy introduced korisil it introduced diarchy at the provinces now that system of diarchy has been eliminated by government of india act 1935 in place of diarchy okay in place of diarchy it was said that the central that the provincial legislature will have indians and those indians will be able to take decisions on all the subjects okay on all the subjects and and it was also said that the executive council okay the the, the you know the provincial executive council there used to be two executive council one was the governor general executive council which was at the center and the other was the provincial uh, you know provincial executive council which was at the provinces now it was decided that the provincial executive council will also be headed by an indian who will become the head of the provincial executive council an indian so just imagine an indian was to head the provincial executive council all this while this position was reserved only for a british all this while the position was reserved only for a british for the first time see a uh, provincial the head of the the head of the provincial executive council okay was like the governor general of india of the what of the governor general executive council can you now realize the importance okay what governor general of india was to the central executive council now an indian was going to be to the provincial executive council because he was to head the provincial executive council he was to head the provincial executive council and this indian was supposed to be known from this time onwards as prime minister yes you heard it right this indian was going to be known as prime minister who was supposed to be what who was supposed to be the head of the provincial executive council and how do we elect okay how do we elect indian representatives to both the provincial legislature and provincial executive council it said that this act said that direct elections will be conducted so it was decided that direct elections will be conducted you know so direct elections will be conducted to elect indian representatives to both provincial legislature and provincial executive council so this was the first very very important thing which will come under the provincial uh, head then the second thing see it was also decided it was also decided to introduce bicameralism it was also decided to introduce bicameralism in certain provinces okay in certain provinces it was decided to introduce bicameralism because all this while bicameralism was reserved though it was confined only to the center now number 3 state public service commission was also established under this act why because see this 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 section of the act dealt with provincial autonomy the aim was to give as much autonomy to the provinces as possible as much autonomy to the provinces as possible and as part of that as part of that it was also decided to establish a state public service commission that will be responsible for recruiting okay locals okay it will be responsible for recruiting locals as public servants or civil servants okay and it was as a result of this feature that okay it was at the and, and you know this particular part can also be considered to be the genesis of assam public service commission aps i'm not talking see many of you many of you wrote that this particular act also gave birth to central public service commission which is not right central public service commission was already there it, okay it came into it came into effect or it originated in the 1920s i'm talking about central public service commission it was state public service commission that can trace its genesis to the government of india act 1935 so it was also another very important feature which will come under provincial autonomy then apart from that it was also decided okay apart from this it was also decided to do what it was it was you know it was uh now let's come to the third part okay now the third part dealt with what the third part dealt with miscellaneous now under miscellaneous it was decided to add it was decided to add two more provinces okay it was decided that two more provinces will be carved out of the bengal province on the basis of language 
please remember this point very very important see linguistic language was made a basis for carving out two important provinces out of bengal and those two important provinces were odisha and bihar all this while odisha and bihar used to be a part of the bengal province for the very first time they were made into separate provinces by the government of india act 1935 which took the total number which took the number of the total you, you know which took the number of indian provinces to 11 you know very very important point and the last point which will also come under miscellaneous is that this particular act also decided to extend okay it also decided to extend the concept of separate electorates the concept of separate electorates to the you know to 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 the to the dalit community okay to the dalit community so this is the government of india act 1935 and remember the direct elections i was talking about and one more thing you have to know is that see out of these three parts right at the very beginning i told you that uh, there are three very very important parts and I also told you the content okay, which will come under each of the three parts. Now, these three parts out of these three parts, only part number two and three came into effect. Why? Why did part number one did not come into effect? Because there was a clause. There was a clause and that clause said what? For part number one, that is All India Federation, for the All India Federation part to come into effect, at least 50% of the princely states had to agree. At least 50% of the princely states had to agree to it. And because they did not agree, okay, the number that was needed, that number was not got. Okay, we could not get that number because of which All India Federation did not come into effect. But obviously, part number two and part number three did not have any such clause because of which they came into effect. But although All India Federation of part number one could not come into effect back then after India got her independence, after India got her independence, it was decided, it was decided to introduce the All India or many features from All India Federation were incorporated in our Indian constitution. That is what makes this act the most important British act. Okay. So this was the first question. So I hope even if they ask you, you know, even if this question is of 250 marks, I mean, I'm so sorry. I mean, even if this question is of 250 words, okay. Now I hope that you guys will be answer. The, now I hope you guys will be able to answer this because in this very session, I gave you guys a lot of content. And if you, you know, if you, if you put all the details together, it will be a very nice answer. Okay. Now going to the next question. So the next question was also, uh, you know, the next question was also a 10 mark question. It was also a 10 mark question. The paintings of Ajanta are widely considered to be the fountainhead of all classical paintings of Asia. Discuss in this context the most essential features of the Ajanta paintings. Now see, the question is very simple. The paintings of Ajanta are widely considered to be the fountainhead of all classical paintings of Asia. Now, how will you approach this? I mean, obviously, just like any other answer, you need to give a proper, uh, you know, introduction. Okay, you need to give a proper introduction. Now, this is a question which has been asked from Art and Culture because GS Paper 1 or Paper 2 also includes Art and Culture. Now, see, Ajanta paintings, many of you wrote that Ajanta paintings are the first example of, uh, you know, it is, they are the first example of paintings in India, which is absolutely incorrect. Okay, Ajanta paintings... We cannot ever consider Ajanta paintings to be the first example of paintings in India. Okay, so that is an incorrect thing. But you can always start. But as far as Ajanta paintings are concerned, they are very, very special because of what? Because they are considered to be the fountainhead of all classical paintings in Asia. What is the meaning of that? The later, you know, the later paintings, the okay, the later painting traditions which started in various parts of Asia. They borrowed a lot of things from Ajanta. They borrowed a lot of things from Ajanta that, you know, that, 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 that gives us, okay, that gives us a clarity that sheds light on how important Ajanta paintings are. Okay, that is true. But as far as Ajanta paintings, okay, as far as Ajanta paintings being the oldest Indian paintings is concerned, 
that theory is not right because we have had or we have older paintings okay we have or india we have discovered older paintings in india now the question is what they discuss in this context the most essential features of the ajanta paintings now see let's talk about some of the features of the ajanta paintings now okay features the very first feature is what ajanta paintings were they were free hand style okay the paintings were of free hand style what is the meaning of free hand style that the painters okay the painters of ajanta the painters of ajanta and what is the meaning of ajanta paintings basically we are talking about those paintings we are talking about those paintings which have been done on the walls and ceilings of the ajanta caves ajanta caves uh, as most of you have got it right ajanta caves are located okay they are they are a unesco world heritage site and they are located in the aurangabad district of maharashtra okay there are two caves there are two sets of caves located in aurangabad district of maharashtra one is ajanta the other is elora see now ajanta caves are 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 a buddhist caves now that is again where most of you made a mistake you say that ajanta caves also you know ajanta caves also had jain caves as a ajanta caves also had uh, hindu caves no that is that is wrong ajanta caves only had buddhist caves there are 30 caves in total 29 complete and one incomplete and all the caves are buddhist caves okay it becomes very apparent if you go to ajanta caves you will see you know you will see various paintings okay you will see various paintings which are having a relation with whom various paintings which are having a relation with buddhism or gautam buddha which makes it very evident that ajanta caves were uh, buddhist caves now talking about the features of ajanta paintings like i said number one free hand style that is the painters of ajanta they were not you know they did not have the access they did not use any special devices they were free hand okay those were free hand paintings they did not use scales they did not use any other you know any other device to uh, get the painting right so ajanta paintings are an example of what free hand painting okay that is the first important feature second the second important feature is that ajanta paintings are known for their naturalism ajanta paintings are known for their naturalism now what is the meaning of naturalism you will get to see see you will have to you have to know you have to know the location of the ajanta caves okay like i said ajanta caves are located in the aurangabad but where in aurangabad now you guys must be aware you guys must be aware of the western ghats okay western ghats are very very important in geography okay western ghats are very very important in geography in maharashtra as we all know they are known as sahyadris it was the western ghats which okay which 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 gave a what which gave a uh, vintage point you can say okay it was the it was the western ghats which helped which helped the maratha clan okay which helped the marathas a lot while they were fighting against the mughals okay the western ghats the western ghats it was because of western ghats the maratha warriors were able to launch guerrilla warfare against the mughals so western ghats is very very important and western ghats is not something which is confined only to maharashtra by the way it starts somewhere from uh, gujarat if uh, you know if i am not mistaken and it goes all the way till kerala okay finally in south india it meets it meets eastern ghats at nilgiri okay so western ghats is very 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 important from the point of view of indian geography now uh, so ajanta caves are located right next to western ghats ajanta caves are located right next to western ghats on the banks of a river by the name of waghora okay ajanta caves so i am see why am i making this point because i'm trying to make you understand the geography surrounding the ajanta caves so to cut a long story short ajanta caves are located right amidst the nature they are located right amidst the nature so you can well imagine when we have got ajanta caves located in such a scenic environment so it was very natural for the painters to collect a lot of things from that particular environment so which which gives what which gives a naturalistic touch to the paintings which we get to see in ajanta for example let's talk about the colors all the colors which were used in the ajanta paintings all the colors which were used in the ajanta paintings were natural colors they were not you know they were not artificial colors for example the painters the painters used to collect the black color from soot okay from swot 
they used to collect the uh, black color from suit they used to collect the green color from various plants because they were surrounded by bushes plants trees forests okay they used to collect the green color from those plants they used to collect the blue color from lapis lazuli okay lapis lazuli is something which you will come across even in ivc it's the name as we all know of a semi precious stone so and that is blue in color lapis lazuli so they used to collect the blue color from lapis lazuli so all the best uh, you know all the basic colors all the basic colors were collected by the painters of ajanta from the natural surrounding and after collecting the basic colors they used to mix all those basic colors they used to mix all those basic colors to get even more colors that is how they came up with different colors you know and this is what is known as what naturalism you need to explain this okay you need to explain this in your answer number 3 why do you think why do you think ajanta paintings have lasted for such a long time i mean ajanta paintings are belong to which phase okay they belong to some of you have also written ajanta paintings belong to the phase of ashoka that is not right ajanta paintings are not mauryan paintings they are not as old as the mauryan era ajanta paintings can broadly be divided ajanta caves can broadly be divided into two phases okay they can broadly be divided into two phases the satvahana phase and the vakataka phase okay the satvahana belongs to the post mauryan era vakatakas let's say were contemporaries of the guptas now they belong to these two phases so the paintings also have to belong to these two phases okay so have you ever wondered despite despite ajanta paintings being so old have you ever wondered despite ajanta paintings being so old why or how have the paintings survived till today why have they survived why have they survived or how have they survived how have ajanta paintings how have ajanta paintings survived till date despite the fact that they are very very ancient how or why you know in history why okay why and how are much more important than what and where always remember that in history why and how are always important than what and where now see the thing is that it has survived for one reason because as far as paintings are concerned okay you must have studied this in art and culture paintings are largely uh, of Uh, two types okay as we all know one is mural paintings the other is what the other is miniature paintings now ajanta paintings are mural paintings okay what is the meaning of mural paintings mural paintings are those paintings which are made on solid surfaces like walls now see but what most of us do not know is that mural paintings can also be of two types okay one painting is that which is done on a dry surface who can surface or তোমার এটা পেইন্টিং করা হয় ওকে বাট দি আদার কাইন্ড অফ মিউরাল পেইন্টিং ইনভলভস পেইন্টিং অন আ ওয়েট সারফেস দ্যাট ইজ नोन एज व्हाट दैट इज नोन एज फ्रेस्को ওকে दैट পেইন্টিং ইজ नोन एज फ्रेस्को फ्रेस्को পেইন্টিংস আর দোজ পেইন্টিংস হুইচ আর ডান তোমার ওয়ালোতে করা হয় বাট ওকে व्हाट ডু উই ডু বিফোর উই স্টার্ট পেইন্টিং বিফোর স্টার্টিং পেইন্টিং উই ইউ নো উই 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 দ্য পেইন্টারস অফ অজন্তা দে ইউজড টু মেক আ সলিউশন ওকে দে ইউজড টু মেক সাম কাইন্ড অফ আ লিকুইড সলিউশন এন্ড দ্যাট সলিউশন এন্ড দে অলসো ইউজ কাউডং এন্ড দ্যাট সলিউশন ওয়াজ পুট অন দ্য ওয়াল ফার্স্ট দে ইউজড টু পুট দ্যাট সলিউশন অন দ্য ওয়াল এন্ড অন টপ অফ দ্যাট ওয়েট সারফেস দে ইউজড টু পেইন্ট দিস ইজ नोन एज ফ্রেস্কো হুইচ ইজ স্টিল পপুলার ইন ইন্ডিয়া দিস টেকনিক and fresco technique is said to have been introduced by the guptas and that gets very evident in the ajanta paintings okay because of which they have survived till today okay other than that if you if you talk about some of the famous paintings of ajanta then the most famous painting of ajanta or one of the most famous paintings of ajanta has to be the famous painting of padma pani okay padma pani who was padma pani padma pani was a bodhi sattva okay padma pani was a bodhi sattva and if you if you this uh, you know this image is available on google if you check out this image you will come to know that he has always been shown or he is normally shown holding a lotus so the painting of padma pani is very famous okay i'm talking about uh, the paintings which can be seen inside the ajanta caves and other you know other or another famous painting or another famous ajanta painting is the painting of vajra pani okay padma pani and vajra pani both are bodhi sattvas okay both are bodhi sattvas so these were some of the most important features of ajanta painting now let's move ahead now let's go to the third question 
See, what are the various kinds of diversity India has? Is this diversity an asset or a liability for our country? Okay, is this, uh, you know, is this diversity an asset or a liability for our country? Now, see, this is a question from Indian society. We all know the, the first part of the question is asking you what are the various kinds of diversity. Most of you have got this part right. Okay, you can talk about various kinds of diversity like diversity based on religion, diversity based on language, diversity based on culture, diversity based on lifestyle, diversity based on practices, diversity based on, you know, based on so many other things. Okay, there are so many different kinds of diversity that you can, diversity based on race. Okay, in India you can find so many races, Austroasiatics, then tibeto burman okay, tibeto burman then Mongoloid, okay, these are the names of so many races. Negr Negrito, okay. Negrito is also the name of a race. So in India, you will find many races. Dravidians are there, okay. You will find many races. Then, 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 then obviously, uh, you know, I mean, although, although Aryan is not the name of a race, okay. Aryan is not the name of a race, but they belong to a particular race also, okay. They also belong to a particular race. So in India, the point I'm trying to make here is you will find a lot of races. Okay, India is a melting pot. India is a melting pot of lot many races. And uh, so, you know, so you will get to see a lot of diversity in India. Okay, you will get to see a lot of diversity in India. So all those things can be put in, uh, you know, they can be put under part number one of this question. Now, as far as the second part is concerned, is this diversity an asset or a liability for our country? Okay, again, I must appreciate that many of your answers have been on the right track, but the other answers have not been on the right track. So we have to bring them on the right track. So how will you approach this part? See, always keep one thing in mind, and I have said this before also, your answer has to have, has to have a positive touch. Your answer has to have a positive touch. You cannot end on a negative note, no matter, no matter how bad the situation is. You always need to what you always need to evoke a sense of hope. You always need to evoke a sense of hope because see, uh, we all know about the problems. The examiners, the, 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 the conductors of this examination, the government, it knows about the problems already. They are on the lookout for people who have a solution. They are on the lookout for people who have a solution to those problems. Obviously, you know, you have to call a spade a spade, okay? You cannot, if the situation is not rosy enough, you cannot call the situation rosy. But at the same time, what I'm trying to do, or what I'm trying to tell you guys is to, it's always better to end your answer on a positive note. There is still some hope. There is still some hope, okay? So, see, as far as diversity is concerned, as far as diversity is concerned, see, sometimes diversity can be a burden also. Sometimes, at times, diversity can be a burden also. For example, most of you or many of you, not most of you, many of you have wonderfully quoted the recent ethnic clashes which are going on in Manipur. That's a very, very uh, good thing. Okay, that is a very, very good thing that goes to show that you guys are abreast with the recent happenings. That's a fantastic thing. Okay, I must appreciate that. But at the same time, you also, you know, you know, so, 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 uh, so, Examples like this, examples like this prove that diversity can also be or, or can also be a burden because if you talk about the uh, you know ethnic clashes going on between the cookies and the Metis in Manipur, so it is it is they are very different. These two groups are very different from each other. One lives in the plains, the other lives on the hills. Okay, both the groups they speak two different languages. Both the groups have got different cultures. Some people say that. Those, you know, both the groups also follow those, uh, you know, both the groups also follow two different religions. So we have not been able to comprehend whether these clashes are religious clashes or ethnic clashes or linguistic clashes or political clashes. But the recent happenings in Manipur, they make it very clear. They make it very clear that at times diversity can also become a burden. But that is not the end of the story. Okay, there are many more examples which prove that diversity can be a blessing for any country, especially for India. Okay, there are many examples which prove that diversity can also be a blessing. There is something called, okay, uh, there is something called diversity dividend. Okay, just like we have got demographic dividend, which I will come to in a bit, we have got diversity dividend. It always pays. Okay, you can learn from different groups and you can put those things into practice. 
Okay, you can put those things into practice. India would have been a very dull country had people belonging to only one religion, had people belonging to only one religion, or had people speaking only one language lived in this country. Okay, no one would have India would have been India would not have been recognized on a global map. Okay, if the situation would have been otherwise, India today is a power to reckon with only and only because of its diversity. Only because of its diversity, because various groups are contributing to India's success. Okay, various groups are contributing to India's success. No doubt, from time to time, we hear about you know we 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 get to see many setbacks which are again taking place, perhaps because of the diversity India has. But if you compare the benefits deriving from diversity and the uh, you know and the losses India faces because of its diversity. You know, the benefits far outweigh the column of losses. Okay, so that is the approach you have to take as far as answering or as far as answering this question is concerned. See, for example, I can also give you one more example. See, okay. See, as per, um, as per scholars and historians, as per scholars and historians, the people who now live in the South Indian state of Kerala, okay, the people who are living in the South Indian state of Kerala, now, see, these people or uh, I'm, you know, I'm, 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 I'm talking about the Mopila Muslims, okay, they, they, they uh, once upon a time, they used to call themselves Mopila Muslims, they do not just live in Kerala, but they also live in Lakshadweep Island, okay. Mopila and they are one of the most peaceful Muslim communities of India. Now, the thing is that now most of the people of Kerala, now scholars say that these Mopila Muslims, they came from where? They came from the Arabian Peninsula. Scholars are of the opinion that these Mopila Muslims came from the Arabian Peninsula. But now most of these people are working. So now they are Indians, but most of them are working the present generation. The present generation or a bulk of the present generation is working in where? A bulk of the present generation is working in the Gulf countries and they are sending home. How they are playing a very important part in India's success? They are playing a very important part in India's success in the form of what? In the form of remittances. Okay, in the form of remittances. And I am not just talking about Keralaite Muslims who are working in Gulf. Okay. I am also talking about, you will also find a lot of Keralaite Christians and Hindus who are working. See, Kerala is a beautiful example of uh, the secular spread in the eyes. Okay, in Kerala, you will not just find, you know, you will find people belonging to all three major religions almost equally split. Okay, they are almost equally split in terms of population and they live in a lot of harmony and peace. So, now they are, so most of them are working in Gulf countries and they are sending foreign remittances to India. And as we all know, or oh, you guys must be knowing that foreign remittance is also a part of what? National income. In fact, a very, very important part of national income. I hope you guys are aware how to compute, how to calculate national income of a country. Okay. So, you know, these examples can also be quoted in your answer. Now, let's come to this question. As per a report of United Nations, India was poised to surpass China to become the world's most populous nation by the mid of 2023 is this surplus population essentially bad for india analyze the situation in the light of the concept of demographic dividend now there was a recent report as you know as most of you may be aware it said that india's population will soon okay will soon what it will soon uh, you know it will soon outpace okay it will soon outpace the population of china and this report was given it was published by none other than united nations so you can expect a question on this you can expect a question on this in this uh, in the upcoming mains so how will you approach this how will you approach this see india's population india's population remember uh, what i told you okay remember what i told you a short while back your answer has to have a certain kind of positivity that also, that also shows what kind of a person you are. Whether you are a narrow-minded person, whether you are a broad-minded person, no matter what people say, 
all one broad minded people okay because no one you know no one likes negativity okay no one likes a sense of negativity they all want positivity no matter even the hate mongers even even those people who are busy spreading hatred they also do not like negativity okay it's just a matter of time so anyway uh, so uh, you know so population so as far as population is concerned yes you know it is not a hidden fact that india's population is a big cause of concern for india okay india's population is indeed a big cause of concern for india now you can obviously begin like this that india's population india's population uh, is okay india's population is a big cause of concern for the country although if you look at the growth rate okay if you look at the growth rate of india's population the growth rate of india's population now a lot of people you know government you know due to government schemes due to uh, the sense of awareness being generated due to the sense of due to the kind of awareness programs being started by the government in different parts of india now most of the indians have understood the fact most of the indians have understood the what the the the, the bad effects most of the indians have understood the evil or bad effects of a population rise okay now i'm not trying to say that uh, you know india india has been able to successfully india has been able to successfully control its population i'm not trying to give you guys that idea but as far as the population growth is concerned okay as far as population growth is concerned there has been significant amount of progress as far as population growth is concerned there has been significant amount of progress now but nevertheless it is still a long way to go okay a long long way to go now so india's population obviously is a major you know is a, is a, is a what is a major cause of concern for india obviously it's a major cause of concern for india but at the same time there has been another concept okay there has been another concept by the name of demographic dividend and we all know the evil effects of an increasing population so all those things can be put under this there has been also this concept of demographic dividend what is the meaning of demographic dividend demographic dividend means that india's working population is more okay india's working population will be more than india's dependent population okay one population is dependent which depends on the working population and another is working okay another is working which is contributing to india's gdp so india's working population a report says that now it has been proven almost that from around 2030 or you know from around 2030 india's working population will be far more than its what than its dependent population okay india's working population will be far more than its dependent population and this situation will be the same from around 2030 it will be the same let's say till around 2050 or uh, you know to to, to uh, 2055 or so but we need to take advantage of that okay we need to take advantage of that and india will have a young population or india will have a working population at a time when certain other countries like usa and china okay when certain other countries like usa and china will not have a uh, you know major workforce or the point i'm trying to make here is their population will just be the opposite okay their 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 situation will be just be the opposite their working population will be lesser than the dependent population so you know that kind of situation now in order to take advantage so in this scenario in this scenario what we thought to be india's burden all this while that burden can be transformed into a blessing but for that burden to become a blessing india has to approach this in a very planned manner and india has already begun approaching this okay india has already started taking advantage of this huge plus point how now see the thing is that and how do we need to how do we need to take full advantage of this how do we need to take full advantage of this we need to take full advantage of this by promoting certain things first and foremost we have to promote education because because only if the workforce is educated enough only if the population is educated enough they can get the jobs not just in india but but across the globe why across the globe because those countries which do not have a working population or which do not have a major working population they will look you know they will look at other countries okay they will look at other countries to fulfill the or uh, or they will look at other countries who could fulfill the requirement okay they will look at other countries and india definitely will be a very strong contender so 
that way also india can take advantage but for that to happen india needs to promote education the people the people who will be uh, you know eligible for those jobs or they can be eligible for those jobs only if they are educated enough so education is number one india has to promote it india is already promoting education india has to promote education with even more gusto okay with even more gusto number two health okay what is the use of such a young population if it is not healthy so india also has to spend a lot more in the realm of health sadly enough india the kind of you know the kind of uh, the kind of expenditure the kind of expenditure world health organization recommends the kind of expenditure world health uh, who a world health organization recommends you know the kind of expenditure being recommended by world health organization in the domain of health india sadly enough is not witnessing the same kind of expenditure india sadly enough uh, is not witnessing the same kind of expenditure now the other thing is that you know the other thing is that uh, so that was point number 2 education then point number 3 okay then point number 3 would be what then point number 3 would be that okay point number 3 point number 4 was education health and point number 3 would be what development of skills skill development skill development okay and it is in this particular department that i must say the government of india has done or it is taking this very very seriously because of which there have been many skill development programs okay there have been many skill development programs being launched by the government of india only if we take advantage only if we develop these three things we will be able to only if we develop if we develop if we if we promote these three things we will be able to take advantage of the demographic dividend otherwise otherwise india's young population will be will become okay otherwise india's young population will just be a burden for india not a blessing but we can we can turn the tables okay we can turn the tables but for us to be able to turn the tables we have to promote these three things only then we can take full advantage of the concept of demographic dividend now stupas are but the reflection of the most important events of buddha's life and his teachings elucidate unfortunately most of you have got this answer wrong okay see you need to understand the question also the question was about stupas are but a reflection so stupas are nothing but a reflection of the most important events of buddha's life you just had to you just had to write about those features okay you just had to write about those features which are found in a stupa which have a relation with the life of gautam buddha okay for example okay for example i have already spoken about the stupa architecture in detail in one of my discussions so i would request all of you to go through that discussion of mine in which i have talked about the uh, stupa architecture in detail now uh, as far as stupa architecture is concerned okay now some of you may be knowing or most of you may be knowing about one part of stupa which is known as chatri okay one part of stupa which is known as chatri which is present where which is which is present right on top of harmika and the three i'm talking about those three umbrella shaped structures which wrap okay which wrap themselves around the dandi okay dandi is the stick okay and you must have seen those three structures which are wrapping themselves around the dandi now those three structures those three structures which we call chatri so those three structures represent what those three structures represent the three most important parts of buddhism or the three jewels of buddhism dhamma sangha and buddha okay other than that other than that if you if you if you took uh, or if you talk about the i an iconic phase of buddhism that phase when buddha was not represented in the form of a figure he was rather represented in the form of symbols now if you talk about that phase okay for example sarna if you if you if you talk about that phase stupa uh, you know you know this sanchi stupa okay the maha stupa at sanchi okay the maha stupa of sanchi is a very good example of the an iconic phase of buddhism now if you talk about the maha stupa of sanchi 
you will find many symbols okay you will find many symbols which have been used to indicate buddha since they were not allowed to indicate buddha those symbols were used in the place of buddha for example the bodhi tree okay the bodhi tree so bodhi tree is another motif being used in stupa so bodhi tree reflects enlightenment of buddha there was the use of horse horse represents what horse represents mahabhinishkraman okay mahabhinishkraman of buddha or the great departure of buddha then for example elephant white elephant it represented what it represented elephant represented the birth of buddha stupa itself stupa itself represents what the the, the structure stupa itself represents mahaparinibbana of buddha or the death of buddha okay so all these things could have been included in the answer this answer could have been a very beautiful answer on top of that if you talk about the torans the gateways the torans themselves are full of beautiful carvings they are full of beautiful relief work which has a relation with buddhism okay the idea itself why do we why do we get to see why do we get to see such beautiful work on the torans because the idea was to attract the people passing by the stupas the idea was to attract them towards buddhism okay now discuss the salient features of the nagara style of temple architecture now this has been discussed in the class already it has also been discussed in one of my youtube sessions see nagara style of temple architecture some of the most important features is that nagara style is mainly confined to north india okay it covers most of india okay nagara style is the most common type of temple it is the most common type of temple it is the most common type of temple you will get to see in india or most of the temples it covers around 2/3 of india's geographical area barring south india okay barring deep south and for example as far as the deccan area is concerned which particular style you get to see in mainly the deccan area that is what that is the mixture of both dravida and nagara and that is known as vesara style of temple architecture but now let's talk about the most important features see uh, as <coughs> as far as nagara style okay nagara temple is concerned nagara style temples they are always located on a what on a raised platform they are the main the main temple is always located on a raised platform the main temple is always located on a raised platform other than that okay river goddesses of ganga and yamuna are placed at the entrance other than that river goddesses of ganga and yamuna are placed at the entrance now as we all know as we all know be it nagara be it vesara be it dravida style painting or um, i'm so sorry temple they all have a structure known as garbha griha so nagara style of uh, nagara style painting or nagara style temple also has garbha griha garbha griha is the most important part of a temple most sacred part of a temple which houses the idol okay which houses the idol of a god or goddess now but as far as nagara style temple is concerned so we have this garbha griha right on top of the garbha griha we have another structure by the name of shikhar right on top of shikhar we have amalak and above amalak okay above amalak we have kalash and above kalash we have what above kalash we have dhwaj or flag which represents what the flag represents the hold of a particular god in a particular area okay which god is more popular in 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 a particular area that can be said if you uh, find the image of the god being present in that particular dhwaj now talking about the garbhagriha now these were some of the most important parts of a temple which follows the nagara style of temple architecture now now let's come back to garbhagriha now you will notice another thing in a nagara style temple and that thing is what as far as the inner walls of the garbhagriha are concerned they are very plain but the outer but the outer walls of the garbhagriha are full of decoration the outer walls of garbhagriha are full of they are full of what they are full of decorations now these are some of the most important features you can you know some of you have beautifully drawn okay some of you have beautifully illustrated how or what a nagara style temperature or uh, i mean i mean i mean uh, you know some of you have beautifully shown with the help of drawing what a nagara style temple looks like okay that's a very good thing so even in the examination please make it a habit wherever you need to draw something wherever you need to illustrate something do it okay
and another feature can also be mentioned here that uh, there are many Nagara style temples which have been designed, which have been designed in the form of Panchayatan style. So Panchayatan style is another feature of the Nagara style of temple architecture. What is this Panchayatan style? Panchayatan style is that style where you will have the main shrine located right at the center. You will have the main shrine located right at the center and you will have four subsidiary shrines located at four corners. Okay. Okay, you have this main shrine located right at the center and four subsidiary shrines located in four corners of that particular place. So these four subsidiary shrines basically surround this uh, central shrine. So that style is known as Panchayatan style. For example, the Shavatar temple. Okay, for example, the Shavatar temple. Now see who developed this Nagara style of temple architecture that can also be included. Now the Nagara style of temple architecture was is said to be developed by the Guptas. And two of the oldest examples, two of the oldest surviving temples of India are also those two temples which are said to have been built by the Guptas. They are what? They are number one is the Shavatar temple which has been found at the Diogar district of Uttar Pradesh. And the second most important temple is the Bhittargaon temple which has been found at Kanpur again in Uttar Pradesh. And both these temples, okay, both these temples are said to have been built during the Gupta era. Okay, very, very important. Explain. Uh, see, now I will go to question number 14. See, so this is question number 14. Okay, the life cycle of a joint family is driven more by economic considerations than traditional factors. Okay, and you said it. Now, this is basically the life cycle of a joint family. Now, see, what is the question? The question is that the life cycle of a joint family is driven more by economic considerations. See, joint family is something which has to do with tradition. But the fact that today things are changing, today, how long a joint family will survive that depends more on economic factors okay for example okay for example for economic factors joint families also uh, you know uh, you know i mean i mean i mean economic considerations or economic factors are giving birth to joint families at the same time they are also becoming the reason behind the breaking up of joint families so let's first let me give you a couple of uh, you know let me give you a couple of examples where economic considerations have become the reason behind coming together of people you know or where they have become a reason behind the continuance of joint family for example we all know the benefits of a joint family so you know in a, in, a, in a joint family you know there is this support system okay there is a support system so the karbar dhara uh, joint family will have Okay, joint family will have more number of people earning. Okay, joint family will have more number of people earning. So, for example, when at one given point in time, at one given point in time, if one of the family members is out of employment, he can be taken care of by the other family members. Okay, now we all know that if you, if you, if you, uh, we all know the cost. Okay, the cost of, or we all know, uh, you know, you know how much of a burden, how much of a burden is to pay rent on a regular basis. Now, for example, if 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 you know uh, first of all you need to understand the meaning of a joint family joint family is that family where you will see okay you will see people of three generations living together okay children their parents and let's say the parents of their parents okay so uh, that kind of a setup is known as joint family and for a family to be qualified as a joint family they need to fulfill certain characteristics now uh, i was talking about this i was talking about rent so 
because of this factor also because it becomes easier if uh, many people live together okay because all those people will contribute all those people will contribute towards that trend nowadays we all know about the electricity bills also now if more people live together they can pay they can share the expenses or you know if 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 one of them takes the responsibility of paying the electricity bills the another can take the uh, you know another can take the responsibility of let's say paying the you know paying the gas bills or some other bills okay there are a lot of expenses a family has to incur on a day to day life okay so for 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 these considerations these considerations so the example which i shared with you it is it is one of the reasons behind the continuance of joint family but again economic considerations are also the reason they also become the reason behind the breaking up of joint family a very important reason would be see in search of better opportunities when people go to towns and cities so when they go to towns and cities so in search of better opportunities will also be an example of what it's an example of an economic it's an example of an economic consideration so when they go there when they find better jobs they do not they 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 really come back to their villages they really go back to their homes so they start living separately so that can be cited as one of the reasons which which leads to what which leads to breaking up of the joint family system okay which leads to breaking up of the joint family system so all these things so this is one particular question which can be looked at from two different sides okay so that is the approach you guys have to take now discuss the most important reasons behind child marriage what are the various steps being taken in assam to weed out this social evil now this has also been discussed in one of my previous sessions child marriage okay discuss the various reasons for example number number one reason is what poverty lack of education okay poverty and lack of education these two are the two most important reasons in certain cases dowry also because there is this concept if you marry off a girl at an early age you have to pay a lesser amount of money in the form of dowry in comparison to marrying of that girl at a later age if you if you marry of the same girl at a later age then you have to pay a, a higher amount of money in the form of dowry so that acts as a driving force for a lot of parents to give their daughters in marriage at an early age so that is another reason and of course lack of education poverty all those are there now what are the various steps been taken in assam to weed out the social evil see assam has already assam has been following two important acts for example the child marriage act okay the prevention of child marriage act as well as the pocso act the prevention of child marriage act of 2006 and the pocso act that is prevention of uh, you know you know protection of children against sexual offenses act okay that was passed in year 2011 and uh, most of you may be aware of the recent arrests which were done by the government of assam in order to weed out the social evil most of those arrests were made most of those arrests were made under these two acts so pocso act okay uh, you can talk about the pocso act you can talk about the uh, you know the the, the uh, prevention of child marriage act apart from that assam government specially has been or it has introduced two important schemes it has introduced two important schemes to dissuade or to discourage parents from giving their girls uh, you know you know it has it has it has introduced two important schemes to dissuade or to discourage the parents from promoting child marriage for example sukanya samriddhi okay for example sukanya samriddhi scheme then you can also talk about the arundhati scheme the arundhati gold scheme where the government of assam pays a certain amount of money at the time of the daughter's marriage why because this also acts as a burden okay this also acts as a burden and because of this when the parents think that anyway i'll have to pay i'll have to pay a lot of so if i you know if i marry my daughter later i'll have to pay a lot of jewelry so it's better if i give her in marriage at an early age and avoid paying that much amount of jewelry so the government of india has come up with this idea of helping that family with a certain amount of money i think it starts from 30000 or something like that uh, helping that family with a certain amount of money so that so that the parents dissuade from promoting this social evil so these are the various steps which the government of assam is taking and apart from that the government of assam is also creating a lot of awareness to make people know the uh, harmful effects of child marriage okay so all these examples can be cited then coming to question number 16 See, Namgor are a lifeblood of Assam's villages. In this backdrop, discuss the role of Namgor in the social-religious life of 
Rubella Sam. So how are Nam Gors or how do Nam Gors play a very important role in the social religious life of Assam? I'm happy to say that most of you have got this answer right. And you have to write, uh, you have to get it right because we all are SMS after all. So uh, how can you not know about Nam Gors, right? So this was a very simple question. So how does it affect the social religious life of Rubella Sam? See, one thing needs to be understood in the first place. Nam Gors are a place of worship. And Nam Gors, they preach what? They preach one simple message. And Nam Gors, uh, Nam Gors, they're an embodiment. They're an embodiment of the great teachings of Mahapuru Srimoto Hongkordev. And as Mahapuru Srimoto Hongkordev, he placed a lot of importance on the fact that we all are equal in the eyes of God. All human beings are equal in the eyes of God. So Nam Gors also preach the same. So when the SMS youth, when the SMS people go to the Nam Gors, they, so they, 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 they get to learn these things. So Nam Gors are making them broad minded. So that can be written. Okay. Because Echo Horan Nam Dharma, the crux of the teaching of the Echo Horan Nam Dharma is what? Fraternity, equality and a sense of brotherhood. So when they get to learn these things, when they get to learn these things, so Nam Gors end up promoting a sense of brotherhood, a sense of egalitarianism and a sense of what? Fraternity among the people, among the Asmi society. And Nam Gors, by the way, is not just a place of Worship. Namgor is not just a place of worship, but Namgors have also become an important cultural center. So when the people go to see the dramas, when the people go to see, of course, the religious dramas, when the people go to see, uh, you know, the, 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 the cultural performances having a relation with religion. So uh, that way also culturally, you know, culturally also they get inspired. Okay. Culturally also they get inspired. Apart from that, Namgors, they also play the role of a village court. Okay, where uh, where many social issues, okay, generally the issues which are brought to Namgors are social issues. So where many social issues which are not of a very serious nature, where social issues are being dealt with. Okay, where 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 where, where social issues are being dealt with in a very in a very amiable manner. And Namgors, by the way, are another place where the sense of democracy is promoted. Okay, where a sense of democracy is promoted, every village, Namgor is something which you get to see in a village, uh, you know, normally. So every member, every villager has a say, okay, every villager has a say in the affairs of the Namgor. That is also a very important characteristic and that goes to affect the mentality of the uh, people also. You know, they get to see the good things, they get to see the key, they get to see the advantages of living in a democratic culture. So Namgors are also promoting this democratic culture. Okay, Namgors are also promoting this democratic culture. Apart from that, Namgors, you know, they are they are acting as a village court. They are acting as what? They are acting as a village court. They are, you know, they are also acting as a village parliament because Namgors, they also make certain small, small local laws. Okay, they also make certain rules and regulations for the people who are members of that Namgor or who are followers of a particular Namgor. So in this way, Namgors are not just a place of worship. Namgors are not just a place of worship in the words of Banikanto Kakoti. Namgor is the perfect example or a Namgor is what? It is a village court, it's a village parliament as well as a village church. Okay, so that is how you should approach this answer. See, Vedic literature shed great light on the socio-economic life of the Vedic age in this Backdrop, describe the Vedic literature in detail and mention its significance. Most of you have written about the Vedic literature, but not in great detail. See, Vedic literature, as we all know, can be divided into two broad categories. Okay, into two broad categories. Number one is what? Number one is, number one is Shruti, the other is Smriti. Shruti is that, uh, you know, Shruti is that part of Vedic literature which is said to have had what? Which is said to have a divine intervention kind of a thing. Okay, Shruti is that part of Vedic literature which has to have or which has, which is believed to have what? Which is believed to have a divine intervention kind of a thing. And, uh, you know, uh, Smriti is that part of Vedic literature which does not have a divine connection. Okay, which does not have a direct divine connection. Now, if you talk about the uh, Shruti part of the Vedic literature, so the four Vedas which put together uh, are known as Samhitas. So, Samhitas are basically what Samhitas include the four Vedas that is Rig Veda, okay, Rig Veda, Yajur Veda, Sam Veda and the Atharva Veda. So you can talk about these four Vedas, then, then Shruti also includes, okay, Shruti includes the four Vedas, then it includes the Brahmanas, then it includes the Aranyakas and the Upanishads. And Upanishads as we all know are very, very important because 
they are the philosophical basis of hinduism so these are the examples of vedic literature which will come under shruti then what will come under smriti smriti also includes other kinds of vedic literature for example shat darshan the six schools of philosophical thought okay okay yoga samkhya all these are part of it then for example vedanga okay the auxiliary the seven limbs of the vedas the seven limbs of the vedas for okay the seven limbs of the vedas for example vyakaran chanda okay and all that now you can also here talk about dharma shastras you can talk about puranas you can talk about upaveds okay and you can also talk about the epics that is mahabharata and ramayana all that can be put under vedic literature and as far as significance is concerned see vedic literature although vedic literature's main crux is on religion but while talking about religion it also gives us much clarity it also gives us an idea about the socio economic life of the people living in that particular area we come to know from vedic literature that at least in the rig vedic phase or the early vedic phase cattle was the most important cat cattle especially cow was the most important asset for the rig vedic people or the early vedic people cattle okay and we also come to know about the location we also come to know that rig vedic people used to live in an area that is known as sapt sindhu okay the land of seven rivers the five tributaries of indus plus indus plus there was another river by the name of saraswati and it today corresponds with the swat valley with the swat valley region of pakistan okay swat valley is a valley of pakistan today so this sapt sindhu region according to scholars it corresponds with the swat valley region of pakistan so very very important okay for example we come to know that the rig vedic people were pastoralist they were not into they were not that much into agriculture they were primarily pastoralist the you know the vedic literature also gives us an idea about the rig vedic society about rig vedic economy about also about the geography okay for example we come to know that during the later vedic period okay during the later vedic period people had started turning into agriculture okay we also come to know that during the later vedic period land replaces cattle as the most important asset we also come to know that during the later vedic period the people are no longer living in the sapt sindhu region but they are living somewhere in the upper gangetic plains and vedic literature also tells us about the condition of the women belonging to that part for example we come to know that during the ancient part or during the rig vedic period women used to enjoy a lot of liberty in comparison to the later vedic period because of all these things okay vedic literature is very very important for us then for example india nationalism was the child of british raj critically examine this statement of r kuplan in the light of the events unfolding in the 19th century okay 15 marks see basically critically evaluate okay or critically examine so when whenever you find this word critically examine always keep one thing in mind you have to go against as well as at the same time you you have to give two pictures okay you have to give two sides you have to write about two sides or you have to critically examine okay see indian nationalism was the child of british raj this was the complete statement was what indian nationalism was the child of british raj and 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 the british raj took great care of indian nationalism like for example it you know it 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 had indian nationalism develop in a cradle mane nora jhulna jhulai jhulai it promoted indian nationalism so the the message that this particular statement is giving is that indian nationalism is something which the british raj manufactured intentionally indian nationalism is something that the britishers had manufactured intentionally now now you know common sense tells us that the britishers will never do that any colonial power not just the britishers any colonial power will not try to develop a sense of nationalism among among the people whom it is ruling that is what common sense says so obviously we cannot support this okay we have to go against this and we have to go against this and we have to prove that indian nationalism was not something which was produced by the british intentionally rather it was something 
which came into effect due to a lot many factors now you have to write down those factors for example okay for example economic consequences of the british rule okay some of you have written this thing as indirect consequence indirect consequence so you can also uh, say that the britishers they did not directly promote indian nationalism but yes some of their actions promoted indian nationalism yes okay that is the right way to approach or you can say that the britishers they never tried to promote indian nationalism intentionally whatever happened happened unintentionally for example the economic consequences the kind of the kind of economic policies the britishers had introduced in india okay for example the kind of land reforms okay the kind of things they did in india for example day 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 they destroyed the uh, you you can you can talk about deindustrialization okay you can talk about the drain of wealth okay wherein they took all the resources from india and in return they gave india nothing okay they gave india simply nothing okay now all that thing can be included okay for example so the economic consequences of india the fact that the britishers were trying to interfere with the religious customs of indians the fact that way the fact the fact that they were trying to promote the britishers were trying to promote what the the fact that they were trying to promote they were trying very very hard for example people like macaulay were in the favor of using they were in the favor of making english as the medium of instruction so in a way the britishers were trying to promote what they were trying to promote the western school of education the western style of education and they were trying to promote they were trying to promote the english language so it was not liked by many indians okay who believed in what who believed in the traditional system of education which was being followed in india then you can also talk about the actions okay you can also talk about the actions of particular governor generals of india for example lord lytton and here you can also talk about the vernacular press act of lord lytton being introduced in 1878 the vernacular press act then you can also talk about the arms act okay you can also talk about what you can also talk about a controversy which erupted during the reign of lord ripon and that was what that was the ilbert bill controversy now all these things all these things then uh, you can also talk about you can also give certain political reasons for example doctrine of lapse okay doctrine of lapse you can also talk about the fact that the britishers were trying to interfere with the uh, tribal people they were trying to interfere with the rights okay which have been enjoyed by tribal people since centuries they were trying to play with those then there were also there were also there were also examples of what now 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 uh, for example when they introduced the railways so the railways although their intention was what their intention was to they introduce railways for their own uh, you know you know then 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 for example they so 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 they 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 uh, now this okay they 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 uh, when they try to interfere with the tribals okay when they try to interfere with the tribals the tribals also responded in the form of santhal uprising and all that so all that thing happened so all those things all those things contributed to the rise of indian nationalism not a single factor all those things contributed to the right of uh, to the to the what rise of indian nationalism okay for example the britishers were what they were they were supremacists okay they were white supremacists they were deeply racist or at least a uh, few few governor generals of india were deeply racist for example little you know he himself was what he himself was a racist he himself was an imperialist so all those things all those things contributed to the rise of uh, to the rise of nationalism okay all those things okay for example uh, you can also talk about the social reformers okay they were also trying to reform the society okay then you can also talk about the development of the vernacular press now of course vernacular press was developed by the britishers but when the vernacular press okay when the vernacular but the same vernacular press started highlighting the local issues of the indians it started the it started highlighting the problems being faced by day to day indians okay problems being faced by normal indians in their day to day life and they also started promoting nationalism okay the vernacular newspapers so because of all these reasons okay all these reasons led to the rise of indian nationalism so you have to oppose this particular statement you have to oppose this particular statement see examine the role of mahatma gandhi in giving a moral and ethical foundation to indian national movement 15 marks now most of you the kind of answers you wrote okay the kind of answers you wrote they were okay but not that good i mean most of your answers were not that good and you also got this question wrong 
Okay, most of you have got this question wrong. See, it's a very, you know, it's a very, very important question. Okay, examine the role of Mahatma Gandhi in giving a moral and ethical foundation to Indian national movement. Most of you have written about the uh, movements which were started under the leadership of Mahatma Gandhi. Whereas the question was about the principles or the contributions of Mahatma Gandhi. Okay, now see moral and ethical foundation. So the principles have to have a connection with 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 moral and ethics so see number one okay so here basically you have to write about the most important part of this answer will be what will be the principles being introduced by mahatma gandhi in indian national movement for example number one non-violence non-violence was something which was introduced by mahatma gandhi he was deeply deeply influenced by jainism Non-violence was uh, a principle which was influenced, uh, you know, which was introduced by Mahatma Gandhi to Indian national movement. The principle of non-violence, he was deeply influenced by Jainism. At the same time, he was also influenced. He was also influenced by several great personalities. Okay. He was also being influenced by several great personalities like Leo Tolstoy. Okay. Leo Tolstoy's book, Kingdom of God is Within You. It greatly greatly inspired Mahatma Gandhi in which Leo Tolstoy has uh, spoken he, ha he has spoken in favor of non-violence he has proven he has he goes on to prove how violence he goes on to prove the futility of violence so Mahatma Gandhi you know he draws a lot of inspiration from these works and he starts behaving like the ambassador of non-violence so non-violence is a very important thing which he brings into the Indian national movement and what kind of a non-violence according to Mahatma Gandhi not violence if suppose even if you are having even if you are having a feeling of animosity and hatred for your enemy that is also not Manedhara if you are not doing any physical harm to your enemy but at the same time you are harboring a sense of hatred or you are harboring uh, you know bad feelings for your you know for your adversary that is also not violence that is also not not uh, that is also not non-violence that is also violence according to Mahatma Gandhi so in the opinion of Mahatma Gandhi real non-violence is when you are not causing any physical harm to your enemy at the same time you are also not having any bad blood for your enemy that is the real example of that is the real meaning of non-violence according to Mahatma Gandhi Okay, then for example, another thing, okay, another principle or another method was Satyagraha. Okay, Satyagraha means what? Satyagraha in English, it is known as passive resistance. But in actuality or in actual sense, it was much more than passive resistance. Now, Satyagraha, it primarily rested on two pillars. Satyagraha as a principle primarily rested on two pillars. One was on non-violence, the other one was truth. He said that no matter what happens, you cannot move yourself away from truth. No matter what happens, you cannot move yourself away from non-violence as truth and truth. And he made it compulsory. And he made it compulsory for his, for his followers. He made it compulsory for his followers not to deviate from these two principles of truth and non-violence. Even if the... Uh, he said that even if the Britishers, okay, even if the Britishers were attacking you, you are not supposed to retaliate. You are not supposed to retaliate. And all these principles were actually implemented by Mahatma Gandhi. All these principles were implemented by Mahatma Gandhi when he launched the various mass movements, be it non-cooperation, be it civil disobedience movement, or be it quit India movement. Of course, now whether his followers, whether his followers uh, you know whether his followers listen to him whether his followers listen to him with the utmost you know with the with 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 whether the followers accepted his teachings or not that's a different thing and we have seen evidences that his followers they accepted most of his teachings okay he accepted the followers of Mahatma Gandhi the followers of Mahatma Gandhi accepted most of his teachings but but Manenhara but in varying degrees but in varying degrees. So we always get to see what? We always get to see, especially during the first mass movement being launched under his leadership, that is non-cooperation movement, the, the people were not yet ready. So the people took some time. The people took some time before understanding the concept of non-violence that Mahatma Gandhi was trying to promote. The concept of Satyagraha that he was trying to promote. So it took some time. So 
as far as implementation of these principles was concerned, we get to see varying degrees of success. But we must appreciate the kind of effort being put in by Mahatma Gandhi in this department. Then we can also talk about this Sarvodaya. Sarvodaya means what? Welfare for all. So it basically talks about a welfare society. Welfare for each and everyone. Welfare for each and everyone. Okay, Sarvodaya means what? Welfare for each and everyone living in the society. So this was also promoted by Mahatma Gandhi. Then, then another very important thing which was done by Mahatma Gandhi was introduction of constructive programs. Now these constructive programs were introduced or they were conducted by Mahatma Gandhi whenever a mass movement was not happening. Okay, for example, Mahatma Gandhi used to believe in a strategy. He used to believe in what? He used to believe in struggle through struggle. Okay, after every phase of struggle, there has to be a phase of break or truce. Truce. So it was during the phase of truce that these constructive programs were introduced by Mahatma Gandhi and what was being done during these constructive programs, he used to he used to talk, he used to talk against untouchability, he used to talk about the need for Hindu Muslim unity, he used to talk about the upliftment of women. So all these have a connection with moral and ethics. So all these can be put in the answer and you can also put how these were actually used by Mahatma Gandhi in all the mass movements. How a slight deviation from these mass movements, how a slight deviation from these teachings in the mass movements led to what? Led to cancellation of those mass movements. For example, a Chauri Chora incident. The moment that incident happened, Mahatma Gandhi immediately called off that movement because it was a deviation from his teachings. Okay. So all these can be put under this. Now, now coming to the last question, and that is compare British India's policy for the tribals with Nehru's tribal policy in independent India. How did the tribal population react to British policies? First of all, you have to understand one thing. Okay, what was the British tribal policy? What was the British tribal policy? The Britishers they were least interested. They were least concerned about the tribal rights. The tribal people, they were, see the tribal people, they were living, they were living very, uh, they were living very close to the forest and they, 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 they had been living very close to the forest from time immemorial. All of a sudden the Britishers, the Britishers made them foreigners in their own land. I mean, you, you know, I mean, all of a sudden the Britishers, they, 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 they passed the Forest Act or they passed many laws which prohibited the tribal people from collecting minor forest produce. And they had been collecting minor forest produce since a long, long time. And they considered their, you know, they considered that to be their birthright to do that. And suddenly the Britishers, they were, they were, they were, they decided to, you know, they, they, they decided to keep them away from those forests. They decided to keep them away. They did not allow them. They did not allow them to collect the minor forest produce. Okay. And all these, you know, all these uh, policies resulted in the formation or in the development of a deep sense of, you know, all these policies resulted in the formation of a deep, you know, in the, in the uh, formation or development of a deep sense of a deep sense of hatred. Okay. In a deep sense of hatred among the tribals against the British. Okay, for example, when the Britishers, uh, when the Britishers introduced this permanent settlement system, so under permanent settlement system, new people, okay, new people, uh, see the tribals, see the tribals, new people were suddenly, all of a sudden, under permanent settlement system, new people, completely new people were made landlords. Okay, completely new people were made landlords and they were taken to those areas. Okay, they were taken to those areas. So suddenly the tribal people, see the tribal people, you have to understand one thing. They are very concerned about their, you know, they are very concerned about their tribal rights. Because many of the tribal rights have been violated in the past. So they are very concerned about their tribal rights and they do not like, they do not like, they, they, they what, they prefer a sense of alienation from the society. They prefer a sense of alienation from the society. They prefer some kind of isolation. So the moment they got to see that foreigners, people who do not belong to this area, they have started staying. They have started living in their areas. So obviously they will not appreciate this. And all of a sudden, you know, all of a sudden they started calling them, especially the Santhals. Okay, the Santhals started calling them Dikhus. So who were Dikhus for the Santhals? Especially the landlords who have been brought by the Britishers from outside. Because the 
previous landlords okay the previous landlords were kicked out of their jobs and new landlords replaced the previous landlords and the new see the previous landlords Although they were landlords, they were from that particular area. But new landlords, they had no connection with that particular area. So, so suddenly they saw foreigners and foreigners. Okay, they saw foreigners all around them. So the Britishers, to cut a long story short, they did not recognize the tribal rights, and at the slightest of opportunity, they used to violate the tribal rights. Okay, they used to violate the tribal rights, and in response to that, okay, in response to that, at the same time, they used to tax them a lot more than what. They uh, used to be taxed. Okay, uh, they started taxing them a lot more than what they were subjected to before that. Okay, they used to. They started taxing them a lot more than what they were subjected to before that. So all this, all this resulted in a sense of resentment. All this resulted in a sense of resentment among the tribals who, who, whenever they found an opportunity, they attacked the Britishers and. Now talking about the response, so they responded very very violently. Okay, if you have to talk about two major tribal rebellions, one has to be what? One has to be the Santhal Rebellion of 1855. And what was the cause? The cause was the same. They started what? They started depriving the tribals. They started depriving them of their tribal rights, of their forest rights. That did not go down well with them, and they started responding in the form of Santhal Rebellion. And at the end of it, the Britishers crushed that rebellion very very brutally they shot them all down that happened in 1855 just two years before the sepoy mutiny of 1857 and another major rebellion another major rebellion broke out in 1899 under the leadership of the great birsa munda okay and this this munda rebellion is also known as what ulgulan that is what uh, you know uh, the great tumult the great tumult or the great disturbance ulgulan and the santhal rebellion is also known as santhal hul okay santhal hul so basically the the tribal policy of the britishers was not at all good in response to or, or, or in comparison to the british tribal policy nehru's tribal policy was entirely different okay nehru's tribal policy was just the opposite of the british tribal policy nehru nehru's tribal policy uh, has been given the name of you know Nehru's punch shield or the five things or the five things which guided Nehru's tribal policy for example Nehru said that we cannot you know I mean all these things have been mentioned in the uh, you know in the in the in the uh, PDF so Nehru believed in non-intervention of the tribal rights he did not believe in intervening okay he did not believe in intervening he also said that we will allow tribals we will allow he also said that we are not saying that tribal areas uh we also know that tribal areas have to be developed okay nehru said that right after india's independence we also know that tribal areas need development but only the tribals will decide the rate of development we will not impose we will not impose see a very important point we will not impose our views on them let them decide let them decide what kind of a rate of development they want so we will proceed or we will make progress at that rate okay at that rate which they are okay with okay we will not try to impose our views and opinion on them so all these things okay all these things or i mean another thing was that in which uh, nehru and his colleagues they decided to give them a sense of what a sense of alienation okay they decided to give them a sense of autonomy they decided to give them a sense of autonomy and see these things have also found an expression in our indian constitution in the sixth schedule and finally and finally we also get to hear of something which is present even today especially in the especially in those areas where tribals are found in majority and the name of that body is what autonomous councils for example in assam itself we had a uh, missing autonomous council we have motok autonomous council we have tiwa autonomous council okay so all these are we have deori autonomous council so we have Carby Autonomous Council. So we have these autonomous councils. Okay, Rabha Asom Autonomous Council. So we have these autonomous councils. So autonomous council was also the result of Schedule Six. What is the most? What is the uh, importance of these autonomous councils? What is the need of these autonomous councils? Autonomous councils are given a certain degree of autonomy to let them take some of their decisions to let them take most of their decisions so we are not interfering see tribal autonomous council is again a reflection of nehru's tribal policy of what non-intervention in the tribal affairs 
Okay, having said that, we have come to an end of today's discussion. My best wishes are with you. Please put your best foot forward. And in case of any doubt, you know, in case of any doubts, you guys can always get in touch with us. Okay, in case of any doubts, please get in touch with us. You already have our phone numbers. Okay, you all you already have our phone numbers. You can visit our website that is casap.co.in. Okay, you can visit our website casap.co.in. We are also available on the various social media platforms like Facebook and Instagram, wherein we keep posting a lot of stuff that may help you in the upcoming mains. That will definitely help you in the upcoming mains. So you can either visit our website, you can scan the QR code, or you can also give us a call at 912751541. I will repeat the number 912751541. We are always we are always there for you. Okay, thank you so much. All the best.